Welcome to our 2010 Digital CMO Summit. So show of hands, how many people uh, participated in our cocktail party on the beach last night? Wow, that's great. We had an absolutely, so those of you who didn't, we had an absolutely fantastic event last night. And to shill a little bit for our own event, you know, how many times do you get to go to a conference, have flip-flops in your welcome package, go out and, you know, go on a beach with the Miami uh, sunset behind you, Miami Bay sunset behind you, have a mojito in one hand and your toes in the sand and get together with leaders in our space and talk about how we transform the industry. So that was phase one, as I understand. And at my age, phase one kind of concluded it for me for the evening. But then I understand there was a phase two. Uh, phase two involved, you know, dinner in South Beach. As I understand it, it involved about 20 or 30 hardy participants making it to the Clevelander. And I understand there were shots, as I understand it, probably just a couple, cigars, and amazing people watching. So, uh, so thank you all for uh, persisting through that and for making it here bright and shiny right on time uh, this morning. So a little bit of context about this event before we get rolling. So when we started thinking about a client event, a lot, what turns out to be quite some time ago, we had a couple very specific goals in mind. We wanted to create value for all of the participants by getting clients together to share experience and best practices. We wanted to take this opportunity to learn from each other. And one and really important thing that I think is different about this event than many others is we wanted to create connections and relationships with people that would persist long after the event was done. So the goal back then when we started this with our first client event in 2004, those goals are very much the same today. And I'll explain what that means in a couple of minutes. So when we first started this event, we had four clients in a room at the Harvard Club. So think of the Harvard Club in Boston. So think a little bit about the imagery. Four clients, because we're very concerned about kind of competitiveness and not sharing information. Four clients at the Harvard Club in Boston, which is just a grand building, steeped with tradition, statues, I think there's a moose in the moose head in the, in, the, uh, in the main lobby, great chandeliers, but a little ragged, a little, a little torn, a little, a little threadbare. Contrast, if you could, and think about that imagery, and contrast from the Harvard Club and Commonwealth Avenue to South Beach. What a long, strange trip it's been. So think about that, and I think that, that imagery, that, that, those, those images that conjure up for me, I think are just to a large degree analogous to the transition that the company has made in these last seven years and also our, in, our industry. So thank you for all being a part of our 2010 event, and I have three things I want to cover off with you this morning. I want to kind of lay out and explain big brand theory, the theme, why we chose it, what it means. I want to share with you some perspective about what big brand theory means for Compete, and I want to give you a quick walkthrough of, the, of today's agenda. So big brand theory. When I think about big brand theory, the first things that come to my mind are a couple things. An explosion, a massive explosion. Collisions happening everywhere. An unprecedented expansion. Apply this theory to the marketing universe and you end up in a world where consumers are thriving online, but brands and media, media companies, to, to, the, to a large degree, are not. Certainly there are exceptions. Try making sense of this digital universe requires that you look beyond two separate universes, to look beyond what we think about as online and traditional. In today's universe, consumers do not delineate between traditional and online, or traditional and digital. They interact, they connect with each other without a differentiation for those two. So I ask, and I think a question for us is, so why do we, as brands and research companies, delineate between those two? So what is the state of the universe today? One way to define the state of the universe 
is to look at the progress that we've made over the last 12 months since we got together in Newport, Rhode Island. So I want to offer you a couple of examples. So think about the change in the, and, uh, and the progress that companies like Facebook and Twitter have made in the last 12 months. So the battle between Facebook and MySpace is all but over. Facebook has 500 million users worldwide and is, and is approaching a billion dollars in revenue. Twitter and tweeting has become a verb in our lexicon in the same way that I would Google something. Think of that progress in the last 12 months. Think about Adobe and Omniture. So last year, Josh James was a keynote speaker at our Newport event. And he was there talking about the relationship that we had formed between Omniture and WP and Compete. And soon after that event, announced the acquisition by Adobe. So I probably, like many folks, were a little, con little confused by that acquisition. And I don't think that I understood it right from the start. But today, as I understand it, the embedding of Omniture tags within Adobe authoring tools is an example of linking together creativity and measurement in one platform, and that's transforming the industry that we're in.